All right, welcome everyone to our March PL Andres All Hands of the Week. Um, excited to talk through a couple of different things. We have, as normal, our uh, working group update with some of the top level KPIs, strategy, team updates as well. We have a ton of spotlights, barely fit them on the slide. And then we have an awesome deep dive from the Daghouse team on W3Up um, and what's new happening in their world, um, integrating things like UCANs into NFT.storage, Web3.storage, and hopefully setting, setting a path that others can follow there as well. Um, so some exciting learnings. Um, as a reminder, if you are new and watching this for the first time, the PL Endres Working Group is one of many engineering and research teams helping cross the chasm and drive breakthroughs in computing to push humanity forward within the PL network. Um, we are all unified and aligned about the internet being one of humanity's greatest superpowers and wanting to make sure it's built on a robust um, and resilient foundation uh, that can scale to all sorts of exciting new breakthroughs and also be enabling of human agency as we uh, make, make some really exciting breakthroughs around things like metaverse, AGI, brain machine interfaces, and many other things. Um, a lot of our work um, goes into protocols like IPFS, LibP2P, and Filecoin, um, but we also help spawn new additional protocols. We contribute heavily to a lot of the protocols that are um, being built across the PL network, um, and we participate really heavily in these open source communities as well um, as kind of like stewards, contributors, folks that are creating new breakthroughs on top of these protocols as well. Um, so our mission is to scale and unlock new breakthroughs for some of these protocols like IPFS, Falcon, Libby2P. We do this by driving breakthroughs in protocol utility and capability, scaling our network native research and development throughout the PL network, um, and also stewarding and growing OSS projects, networks, and communities very openly. Um, here are some of the working groups inside of Endres, um, some of the teams that help push, push this forward. Um, and here's our strategy for this year. Um, stays the same, where we have a core foundation of critical systems stewardship and growth, growing the teams and networks across the PL network that are contributing to these stack of protocols, and then two kind of core focus areas for the year. First, around robust storage and retrieval and making sure that we have you know, large-scale data onboarding, super fast and resilient retrievals, and adoption of that stack for decentralized storage and retrieval. Um, and then a lot of work happening around scalable compute over Filecoin state and data. Um, lots of exciting work happening around programmability of storage through things like FBM, through um, compute over data in, in Filecoin, and then also scaling our chain bandwidth and capacity to support all of the exciting permissionless uh, activity happening uh, at the compute layer. We are using star maps as our um, tool for the um, Android roadmap. This looks a little bit different than last time because I stuck things in themes, um, which makes it way easier to look at. Um, so feedback on this welcome. I literally did this at like three o'clock in the morning, um, but uh, this gives us a bit of a view into the key themes within Endres um, and how we're pushing forward our work. Um, each of these milestones is actually managed by the team that is pushing them forward. Um, which makes it very organized. And you can see we have a ton of things landing at the end of March. So it is going to be a very exciting next Endres All Hands. Please tune back in when we celebrate, fingers crossed, the amazing set of things that will have all shipped. Um, you can see some of the really exciting things happening. We have FBM being deployed to mainnet next Tuesday. So in less than a week, um, we have uh, uh, IPC, Interplanetary Consensus, being deployed on SpaceNet, which is their testnet by the end of the month. Um, we have a lot of work with uh, SPs offering uh, IPFS uh, bit swap retrievals to other Kubo nodes, um, others might who, might, who might be requesting the data um, from, from other nodes in the IPFS network. And we have a really exciting integration between Saturn and the IPFS gateway, which a lot of folks are pushing really hard on um, to bring the first biggest, most exciting CDN customer to Saturn yet, because I'm sure there will be many more in the future who uh, give IPFS Gateway Aaron for its money. Um, sorry, I didn't get through all the other ones, but uh, to, to highlight our progress on our overall OKRs, um, we set pretty uh, aggressive goals for Q1. Um, we're so far maybe like 50% on track with our critical systems goals. Um, you'll hear more about our MVP um, monitoring functionality in a second, um, but so far from like a, you know, SLA perspective, we're, we're maintaining good uptime um, and releasability. 
Um, and we've so far since December, if we look at the end of February, we've made a 25% decrease on our Web2 infra service costs, which is 50% of the way to our goal of a 50% decrease. Um, but that's an additional 25% over the you know 50% we'd made at the end of the year. And so still making pretty awesome, significant progress there. Um, and we still have a lot of headroom to go. Um, we have already reached over 2000 builders. If you look at all of the people who are participating in the FVM uh, early builders program and folks who are deploying smart contracts, participating in hackathons, and we've had a ton of events thanks to the Orbit Events Program. So we are super on track with um, that engagement component for FVM. Um, and then in terms of filling some of our critical open roles, um, we had uh, Isoon who came and joined us uh, as kind of our Endres uh, uh, kind of like uh, strategy and planning uh, coordination role. So filled one of those roles uh, internally, which is phenomenal. Um, and I think we're gonna be on track to fill maybe another one by end of quarter, um, which would put us about 50% toward that goal. Um, in terms of our large scale storage onboarding um, and retrievals, uh, we are about at, uh, I think, 15% of mirrored IPFS gateway traffic is being served through Saturn. So in our remaining month, we have a, a chunk of work to do to make progress towards this goal. But this team has been making phenomenal progress. And so I, I, have, I have optimism that we will get a, a good percent of the way towards our, our high level picture. Um, and then we are 637 petabytes out of our goal of 900 petabytes of data onboarded by Falcoin. And right now, I think we're onboarding about four petabytes a day, um, which is pretty awesome. Um, if we can keep that up, we get closer, but still not all the way to 900 petabytes total. Um, and so we'll probably end up at a, a partial request. Um, and we are not quite yet at 2 million successful retrievals from Falcoin SPs. We have some work to do there as well. Um, and finally, last but not least, our um, work happening around programmability and compute. Uh, we are on track for our FEM launch, not to steal anyone else's thunder, but it's happening and it's very exciting. And I think we are going to blow this 500 unit contracts out of the water, um, even if just a small fraction of our hyperspace um, you know, builders come and deploy their contracts on FEM. That will be small fries. Uh, so fingers crossed. Um, IPC is on track for their space net. Um, upgrade and launch of, of uh, subnets there, um, though I think we're, we still have some user development and adoption to do. So if you want to run an L2 on Filecoin, please come talk to us. Uh, we'd love to, to, to hear about what you want to build. Um, and then uh, we have some uh, a, a lofty goal of hitting a thousand jobs per day on compute over data. Um, and I think we have a little bit of work to build up our adoption set to, to meet that. But there are some really exciting launches coming for uh, COD and Bacalia. So keep an eye out. And with that, I'll pass it off to the IPFS folks. Hi, everyone. Uh, a few words on the, uh, the ultimate peer to peer content addressable network, otherwise known as IPFS, and some metrics. Uh, next slide, please. Top um, uh, on the on the top left uh, is the number of unique uh, IPFS nodes that are seen through um, the bootstrapper nodes of the IPFS DHT, and on the top uh, on the top right, this is broken down to DHT servers and DHT clients. Uh, we see uh, an uptick in the number of um, DHT clients and a downward trend in the number of DHT servers, which, however doesn't necessarily mean that the network size is going down. The dashed black line there shows the number of uh, unique DHT server IP addresses, which means that basically the network is becoming more stable because peers are rotating their peer IDs less frequently. Uh, so you can see more details about all of that in the link up there on graph details. So please go check uh, if you want to know more details. Um, on the bottom, uh, on the bottom left, we have um, the latency to find content on the APFS DHT um, through using the CLI client. So this is not exactly representative of the entire of IPFS, the entirety of IPFS, but rather is a Kubel related thing, which we might be replacing very soon to focus on the network side of things. Uh, you're also seeing a bump um, around last month, which has been um, due to a major incident. Uh, that due, like, uh, due to hard work from all the teams, internal and external, 
um, we have managed to patch and now we see uh, the latency going down uh, very quickly. Uh, so yeah, that's it from this slide. Let's let's go to the next one. Right. So uh, one of the goals has been to, um, as Molly mentioned, to monitor the website latency as one of the OKRs. So on the top you see a matrix where uh, on the on the x-axis, top x-axis, you see the website that we're um, looking at, and on the y-axis. Um, the, the, the region where we made the request from. So inside each, each square, there is um, the latency, the time to first byte at the P50. Um, and on the, bottom, on the bottom, the small number there is the percentage increase based on um, last week. So this is not representative of a longer time period. So it's just work in progress. We're going to have a time series of things as, uh, as a trend line and where it goes, but we can spot uh, problems or you know uh, behavior that needs uh, needs attendance, and on the bottom figure there you can see the um, the comparison to HTTP. Also work in progress. You will see some blue bars that are spiking up. This is not due to network or IPFS problems. It's due to some of our own infrastructure, uh, but it's interesting to see the rest of them and the ratio between um, between uh, what you get from Kubo as compared to HTTP. Uh, lots of room to improve there, uh, but we can definitely spot problems when something comes up with our websites. Um, you can see more of that stats.ipfs.network and feedback and discussion happens at this link down on the uh, bottom left. Thanks. Hey, so yeah, in the in the uh, protocol and implementation world for IPFS, so we've had a lot going on. Uh, we just shipped the 0.19 release candidate for Kubo which uh, has some significant resource manager UX improvements and uh, some gateway changes in it. Uh, Helia's been chugging along. For people who aren't familiar with Helia, it's a new JavaScript implementation. Um, uh, there's uh, a, a, a new gateway binary that we're building. Called, uh, there's a link there to the repo. Um, uh, we're going to be, uh, you know, it's the future for the IPFS.io infrastructure. We're starting to dog food uh, libipfs here, so we've extracted the Kubo gateway code out into a library uh, that we're using for this. Um, there was a experiment done for ba uh, for balancing the buckets in the DHT to improve performance. Uh, too long or TLDR is the performance improvement wasn't as good as we thought it was going to be, but you can read the report there to find out more information. Uh, as Dennis just mentioned. Uh, we added website monitoring to the nebula crawler, which was the images that you saw on the previous slide. Um, uh, yeah, and there was a large network incident uh, that we spent a lot of time uh, resolving. Uh, and we have a lot of follow-up work to make the UX better so that that doesn't happen again. Um, coming up, uh, we've got some more specs. There's a gateway graph API design proposal that's going to be coming up. Uh, we're going to be doing a lot of work on Go Lib IPFS, which is um, uh, we're, we're, the the purpose of this is to uh, make libraries for building your own IPFS implementation, like first class citizens. Um, so you know, as as part of this, we're going to be refactoring a lot of code in the IPFS org and moving stuff around. Um, there's some uh, a lot more details about what we're going to be doing in that link there. Um, and we've got uh, some uh, changes to delegated routing to enable streaming responses, which is important for DHTs. Uh, and Kubo 0.20 coming up uh, with a lot of fixes from that event that Dennis talked about. Um, and Helia also has a lot of upcoming work. Awesome. End of file. Hello. So uh, I'm here in person this time. Uh, so what's up with uh, IP developer experience? Uh, as many of you know, we've been working hard to migrate Kubo from Circle CI to GitHub Actions. Uh, and I'm happy to report that we are just now concluding this, this process. And our research shows that for Kubo, at least, uh, GitHub Actions is not only cheaper, but also faster and more reliable than Circle CI. Uh, and also, as part of the migration process, we've created a comprehensive monitoring solution for GitHub Actions in Grafana. 
Uh, and that solution can easily be deployed to any Oracle or repo in uh, Protocol Labs uh, realm. So if you're interested in gaining insights into your GitHub actions, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, we are definitely more than happy to help you set it up. Uh, and as for the future, our main focus right now is uh, IPFS gateway conformance testing. Uh, and we are dedicating all of our resources to support all the gateway implementers. Uh, we are currently on schedule to start using the gateway conformance testing framework that uh, we developed in Kubo uh, or GoLib IPFS as early as next week. Uh, so it's exciting times ahead. <laughs> That's all from me for now. And thank you. Awesome. Over to P 2 p Hi, everybody. Um, as you know, libp2p is the modular networking stack that's uh, powering IPFS, uh, Lotus, and a whole bunch of other networks um, implemented in many different languages. Uh, next slide, please. So this um, is our KPI slide. I put version 001 uh, with an asterisk since this is the very first version. Um, so what we're tracking today right now uh, and what I want to show you is network sizes. Uh, as of yesterday, approximately 58,000 nodes uh, amongst the networks that we're cataloging. So as you can see, this is from a Kademlia exporter a dashboard um, in Grafana that Max uh, from Russell P2P put together. So uh, those are roughly kind of the numbers that we see there. Uh, in the Ethereum chain, um, as you guys know, after the merge, P2P is powering the beacon chain. So uh, all the beacon chain nodes in total sum up about uh, 5,100. So our hope is that we track some of these uh, metrics, um, you know, every month, so we can see uh, how you know adoption is uh, you know taking across uh, networks. Um, in terms of community activity, we do have a lot of uh, contributions from external contributors. Some great news to share is that some contributors have been so strong that you know we've considered hiring them or giving them grants. So. Hopefully, um, as we progress, you know, we get more contributions and then we can keep longtime contributors. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in terms of highlights, so general project updates, we've defined some OKRs for H1. Uh, I think our main goal is trying to make sure that all the work that we do in terms of engineering is focused on like what creates value for users and really just trying to wrap that into the OKR process. Um, I think we shared last month as well, our interoperability testing efforts are going really strong. We're continuing to invest in uh, testing um, browser uh, use cases like adding WebSocket secure testing. Uh, we're adding stuff for browser to browser. And uh, there's one of the gaps in our testing has been expansive protocol testing. So we're starting to address that by adding connectivity tests for Relay v2. And there will be a lot more coming up. Um, we're doing some benchmarking stuff, so if you'd like, you can go to the slides and see the benchmarking protocol we've specified, and those are being added to different implementations. Um, the HTTP work is still going strong. You know, definitely check out the video that Martin shared for Move the Bytes. Um, and then, you know, a lot of community engagement, I, but the main focus here right now, I think that I want to share with you guys is in the month of March, we want to complete our browser connectivity story. So we hope to have the browser to browser implementation completed in JS lib P2P, browser to server completed in Go lib P2P. And by IPFS thing, we want to kind of showcase to the to the world by creating an example app that any new developer can use um, to quickly launch lib P2P nodes and see connectivity across uh, different browsers using the different transport protocols. Um, as far as implementations, um, we're deprecating Circuit Relay v2, uh, v1 in Go lib P2P and JS lib P2P. Uh, we've had new releases in Go and Rust, um, and in the next JS lib P2P release, we'll have Circuit Relay v2. Um, so that's it for lib P2P. Thanks. Over to Falcoin. Okay, this is going to be a quick one, but to start Falcoin ES, uh, a decentralized storage network for store humanity most important information. <laughs> next slide, please. A uh, very quick API. Uh, as everyone know, uh, Falcoin is one of the biggest storage network. I still believe that's the case uh, in the universe uh, uh, on the total power. However, we are seeing some of the uh, 
like just in our network's perspective, uh, the role by power is dropping a little bit these days uh, because a lot of the uh, sectors are boarded about a year ago starting to expire and uh, more storage provider are saving their like storage for like real deal data and, and all those. So, so you know, Data data sectors takes longer to onboard, and so so the network growth is taking a little. Uh, it's not as fast as before, but again, we still have a lot of storage uh, into the network. However, uh, the real uh, the deal onboarding is not slowing down at all. Uh, we now have over six hundred terabytes of data, Falcon Plus data, that are stored on the network. That's really impressive. Uh, and uh, with Saturn and everything, those data can soon be like retrievable and the compute over with. So th that's exciting. Next slide. You can tell I didn't have enough time to, uh, to finish my slides. However, this is literally the highlight of Falcon in these days. Next Tuesday, Molly mentioned that we are having a Pi Day to launch FEBM. Yay! User can deploy smart contract on the network. Literally, this has been I work for so long for so many, so many, so many people. I don't even really know what to say, uh, but we are down to like six days before the launch. There's a lot of amazing ecosystem initiative and launch that's lined up that I cannot speak of right now, but please follow Falcon Twitter account and everything to see all the ama amazing partnership uh, going live next week. Uh, but yeah, that's it. <laughs> Super exciting days. Um, thank you for all the hard work. I know this is many teams all in crunch mode, making sure that this launch goes really, really well, because it's a big one. Um, and I think we'll hear hear more about some of the progress in a second. Um, but first, let's jump into team updates, um, starting with Bedrock. Hi, uh, so I'm David Rajansky. I'm an engine manager on Bedrock. Um, we work at the intersection between Filecoin and IPFS, and we have three teams that focus across data storage, discovery, and retrievability. Uh, since it's been a while since uh, we presented last, uh, I'm only going to touch on the highlights because the team's made a lot of progress. Um, starting with the IPNI team that's been focused on scaling the network indexers uh, and achieving that scalability with advancements to PebbleDB as well as indexer assignment pools. You can read more on our blog. The Boost team has added BitSwap support, which means that you can serve Filecoin content over BitSwap, which is pretty exciting as well as FEM support, uh, which means you can make storage deals with smart contracts uh, for that upcoming FEM launch, which is exciting as well. And the Tornado team released Lassie, which is an easy to use client library to fetch content across IPFS and Filecoin. And this really unlocks uh, the potential for Project Rea and serving gateway traffic from SPs. And so the team's focus right now is really, how do we unlock that scalability for SPs to serve more retrievals and handle all of that network traffic? And that's what our focus is for the next few months. Uh, and if you wanna find out more, uh, feel free to click on the links or chat in the Q&A. Thanks. Awesome. Everyone go fetch some CIDs with Lassie. Exciting, exciting days. Retrieval market. Retrieval Markets. Um, hi, Patrick here. Uh, Retrieval Markets team is working almost exclusively on Station and Saturn. Uh, the Saturn network has currently got over 1,300 points of presence worldwide. worldwide. And if, you, if you look at the background of the slide, you can actually see some, some dots on a map. Those are the actual points of presence live. And far left, you've got Hawaii, I think that is. Uh, Saturn network serving 158 million requests a day. This is synthetic traffic at the moment, as, you, as you've seen in previous slides, we're starting to mirror traffic as part of the RAIA program, and it's going to be production traffic very, very soon. Um, and there's a pretty good time to first bite as well. From station, we've got 5,570 downloads, and we've got over 21 million jobs completed. Uh, in terms of the roadmap, the Saturn uh, milestone one, which is really our work in Q1, is on track. This involves having verifiable payments uh, written into a smart contract on FEVM, and as well as having some first clients onboarded onto Saturn, which is with the help of the RAIA program again. On the station side, we've shipped a wallet and we have shipped the Zinnia Public Alpha. I'll mention a little bit more about Zinnia in a second, and Miro is going to be speak, doing it in a spotlight in a second too. Uh, and we've now got a station CLI. You don't have to just run station as a desktop app. It can be run on a server as well. And we're also trying to integrate Backer How into Station as a module. Highlights, the RAIA program, as we've heard many times, where we're trying to make data stored on Filecoin available through IPFS. 
uh, or for fast IP plus retrievals and to route large amounts of traffic through Saturn and also saving some info costs at the same time. And it's been a real pleasure working with Bedrock, uh, the stewards team and Bifrost on this initiative. Saturn Goes Web3 Working Group is getting ready to move the Saturn payouts onto Smart Contract on Pi Day. Um, I've already mentioned the next one and Zinnia I won't go into because Miro is going to demo this, this runtime uh, in, in a spotlight. Opportunities, come join the Station Module Builders Working Group if you're interested in Zinnia or Station. And uh, yeah, start fetching stuff through Saturn and through Raya as of today. It's ready to go. Just, just start fetching stuff. That's all from me. Exciting days. Very exciting to get some of these first Saturn clients. Over to Nicola and Max for CryptoNet. Yeah, so we have the CryptoNet 2023 Docker notion. Uh, we have three main themes to improve the Falcon network uh, and to assess those the market needs running a series of interviews to SPs and others in the ecosystem. Uh, then at Medusa, we have like, Medusa really provides a simple, secure, decentralized solution for access control. Uh, the big news is now nucleating and will be an independent company later this month. Uh, we have around 10 teams using FBM and building on Medusa. And then lastly, we have Retrieve.org. That's a retrieval insurance protocol. And uh, yeah, Astro is really interested and excited actually about integrating it. Uh, yeah, then I'll leave uh, the ground to Irene. She'll talk about uh, our protocol updates. Thank you. On the protocol, Fiscon protocol update size, we have work that has been done for improving the mechanism of Filecoin Chrome and also to add the feature of be able to ver verify that aggregation, not giving details on this because we will have Kuba and Alex uh, explaining more in, in this call later on. Then we have published a new FIP, it's synthetic PowerApp. So this is a simple uh, change in the PowerApp pipeline that allows has to save and uh, to reduce the size of the data that has to be stored during the, during uh, one hour and 15 minutes. That is the mandatory time that we have between uh, pre-commit and proof-commit. We think this is, can bring some nice uh, radical cost savings. And there is a discussion actually going on with the storage providers uh, in the FIP discussion page about this. Uh, please go ahead and, and leave your feedback. Also, we started another discussion about optimistic snap deal. So this is um, a way to change the current snap deal protocol, make it much cheaper for providers. It can be up to, to uh, 230 times cheaper for the provider. Uh, it requires some change on the client uh, side as well. So please go ahead. So that's split off there. Go ahead again and, and, and read the, uh, the, 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 this idea. And last, we have, uh, please stay tuned because we will have an upcoming blog post, blog post about the studio that will explain more uh, the last news about this uh, new proving system that CryptoNet has designed. Thank you. Awesome. Definitely go check out the CryptoNet website. It has a lot of this really great content and you can stay on top of everything the team's doing. Great example of network native working in the open. Cameron for Bifrost. Thanks, Molly. Um, so for those of you who don't already know about Bifrost, we're the little team that's responsible for running the IPFS gateways that uh, let our legacy web friends uh, get all the awesome IPFS content that they don't know how to get directly. Um, just wanted to call out a, a few uh, KPIs there about some of the successes the team has had in the last quarter. So we've uh, managed not to have any downtime there. You can see we've done just a little bit over 5 billion requests in the last 30 days. It's not a quarterly stat there. And uh, a little bit under four and a half petabytes of data served in the last month. So that's like pretty sweet. Um, as you might've heard from some of the other teams that were giving updates earlier, we're working quite heavily with um, the RIA project and the Saturn integration there, doing a lot of work about helping to duplicate the traffic uh, around creating some standards for correctness and defining the metrics and, and all sorts of things like that. Um, also, we've been working with our legal on trying to improve the bad bits process. That's something that's a bit clunky and super critical for gateway operators to be able to handle the takedown requests and things that we get. 
so that we basically don't get blocked, which was actually something I'd like to call out for legal helping us with. We got alerted to the fact that IPFS was getting blocked in Korea for a while and they were cool enough to help us uh, get that sorted out through some legalese. So thanks again for that. Um, and yeah, just a, a couple of quick shout outs in the team. Um, Nikolai helped us to super revamp our logging stack, uh, which has been super instrumental with like giving us more visibility to what's going on with the project re uh, work. So thanks again for that. And apologies to any of our exec stakeholders who might have been slightly bumpy right along the way where some things weren't quite connected. Um, also Mario for like doing some crucial work that helped with the cost reduction process. And we've also kind of tied that full circle and automated it. So we've got some Equinix billing exporter that way we can kind of provide a bit more visibility into our InfraSprend. And last of all, all the work that uh, George has been doing to help with project rear and the test environment and the traffic mirroring and all those things. Basically what we're doing in the project there to some degree wouldn't be possible without that kind of apparatus there. So thanks for that. And that's all from us. Awesome stuff. Um, super excited to see all the crossing collaborations here. Um, we are now on to our spot spotlights. Um, reminder to keep them short so that we save a full 10 minutes for our deep dive. And we have a lot of things to cover. Uh, and I believe the first one is a video from Mira. Hello. In today's spotlight, I'd like to show you how easy it is to build new modules for a Filecoin station using our new runtime called Xenia so that you can measure the performance of your peer-to-peer -peer networks and services from different places all around the world. Let's start by implementing the actual probe where we dial a ping protocol, send some requests and measure the latency of how long it takes. Then we write this measured data into InfluxDB using their HTTP API for submitting new data. And we can use the fetch API, which you probably know from the browser. And then we put this all together in a loop, which uh, choose a random peer, then it measures the ping latency and then records the data into InfluxDB. And then using this data, we can visualize what's going on with our network. You can use InfluxDB dashboards or you can pull the data into Grafana. And that's it. It was only 76 lines of code. You can find the full example on GitHub. You can learn more about building station models in our documentation. And finally, if you, this is something you can use for your project, please come and join the Module Builders Working Group. You can find us on Filecoin Slack. Awesome. Thank you, Miro. Um, over to Steve. Great. Yeah. Hello. Uh, IPFS thing is, com is coming up quick, April 15th through 19th here in Brussels, so not many weeks away. A uh, few things want to say. First off, anyone is welcome to this. People working closely on or with the collection of IPFS protocols will will be there, including business, other businesses and infra providers. Um, this is much broader than people just making commits in the GitHub. It's intended to be much broader than people making uh, commits in the IPFS GitHub org. So, for example, teams like Saturn, I think, have a lot to benefit to share their experience and needs, influence others, get feedback, identify product gaps, etc. And this is more than a place just to present status. It's a place to get work done, especially days four and five are going to be open for workshops and brainstorm sessions. So um, please be thinking about how you can leverage this event. Uh, so far, 10 plus tracks, over 100 uh, people have registered. You do need to buy a ticket for this. So if you're part of PL Andres, um, buy a ticket, but obviously talk with your manager. This will come out of um, your, your group's budget. Um, and there is you can request a hotel room to be part of the uh, block that we have. There's messages in PL Slack's lobby there. And please do this soon, ideally this week or next, just to help the organizers out. And there will likely be a pre-meeting coming up for those involved from Endres so that we're aligned and clear on what we're trying to get out of the event for ourselves and for the community. And for anyone watching this that's outside of Protocol Labs, yes, you need to buy a ticket, but know that there is a scholars program, which offers a fully paid opportunity for individuals from underrepresented communities or unique circumstances to join the event. And so again, if you have a demo you want to give, presentation you want to share, or workshop you want to host, please submit that through the website. That's 2023ipfs-thing.io. And uh, you don't have to have all the details named, nailed down, but it really helps the organizers get a sense of what, what's coming. And we'd love to have you be there and participate. Thanks a lot. Look forward to seeing folks soon. Awesome. Hope to see everyone there. It's going to be a great time. Over to Alex for Falcon Cron Risk and Resolutions. Hey, everyone. Uh, so the Filecoin network has this thing called cron, which is a scheduled execution of actor code at the end of every epoch that is done on behalf of the system. So no external party pays for it. Uh, this does some you know, important 
uh, system maintenance tasks. Uh, but uh, we started seeing a lot of work happening in this cron, uh, so much so that it ended up being three times the entire target uh, total for, for an epochs validation uh, happening in this uh, unpaid for bonus uh, extra time execution. Um, uh, this is starting to affect block validation times and fast validation is really important for a blockchain network's decentralization, allowing lots of nodes to participate and keep up with the chain um, and for chain quality so that the uh, block producers can produce their next block on time um, after evaluating the, the previous dip set. Um, uh, we discovered that this the, the built-in storage market is responsible for almost all of this uh, blowout in cron execution. Uh, and uh, because it, it offers a very high level of service to its, its clients of incremental deal payments uh, every day, um, this is probably uh, far too much of a service for a built-in subsidized uh, thing to be offering, particularly since most deals have no payments. And so this is a total waste of time. Um, but happily, we caught this just in time to uh, be able to uh, detect this, understand what was going on, and uh, propose a fix for the Filecoin network in in time to just roll this into our normal release train. Uh, that the next, uh, you know, the release this will target is, is network version nineteen, which uh, you know, the the planning for is already already underway. Um, and so we've done a short term fix, which just you know divide the problem by thirty, uh, and that will buy us you know a good six months, you know at least six months. Uh, to find a more permanent fix for this problem. Um, ultimately, that fix is probably going to be removing this uh, automatic payment uh, processing and putting the built-in market actor down on the same playing field as all other sort of user-programmed actors that could be markets, uh, which won't have access to this uh, cron, primarily because it's very hard to trust uh, the code uh, that's going to run there. Um, so thanks very much to Kabuksu and Zenground, who did most of the work about this and have been on this problem for a while. Um, I just happened to get lucky and, and did the little bit of analysis that discovered it was the market actor. Um, but yeah, you expect this to be fixed and then Filecoin block violation times to drop uh, a lot um, in network version 19 sometime uh, in uh, Q2. Woot woot. Great to see the proactive measuring is helping us take uh, early steps and avoid fire drills. Uh, great, great example of that. We always prefer that versus having to do the fire drill itself. So uh, awesome work, you guys. Hi. Uh, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, hi, uh, I'm Kuba. Uh, so, uh, small deals, uh, small deals, uh, accepting small deals for storage providers is, is an issue. It's an issue, issue of scale for for medium sized storage provider. A storage provider would have to accept on the order of million deals a day to to be able to uh, million small deals a day to be able to fill up their, their selling pipelines. Which is why aggregation services uh, showed up uh, sometime in the past within Falcon Network, uh, like uh, Assure and uh, Storage. Uh, those aggregation services, while they provide the service of aggregation, the client completely currently completely trusts that, that aggregation service, which which is fine for as long as those services are, are trustworthy, which is the case currently. The drawback of that process is the client cannot prove to uh, uh, cannot verify that uh, their data was aggregated correctly, and they cannot show to another party that they, their data was ag uh, aggregated correctly within that deal. Which is why we uh, uh, why we created the verifiable the data aggregation standard, and uh, which produces proof of data, data segment inclusion. So the proof of data segment inclusion ensures correct for aggregation of clients' data within the sectors and allows the client to show that proof to a third party or uh, to, to the contract on chain, which is an imp important use case in FEVVM, -E where, for example, contract uh, uh, people might want to pay for storage of small, small deals, uh, but this wouldn't be able to uh, be executed on because uh, ver uh, ver very small a number of storage providers will accept small deals. So uh, the, the, the standard uh, itself defines how to aggregate the data, how to build an index, which is stored in, inside the sector of all the data that was aggregated within the, the larger deal, such that uh, retrieval is still, still possible and very easy. Uh, we've reached a design consensus and FRC was published. The Go code for proof generation is complete. Uh, we're currently working on a Solidity uh, verifier uh for uh, for this proof such that contracts can verify those those uh those aggregated uh aggregated deals on chain uh and we, we will be starting uh, integration with that storage soon and uh, most likely with estuary as well thank you awesome trustless aggregation is a big problem and uh exciting to see uh, more protocol tools for people to aggregate all of the little data they want to store in Filecoin into nice big chunks that make everyone's life easy to work with. Um, so great work.
check out the FRC if you want to know more. All right, looks like we have a video on you can invocation stack. User controlled authorization network, you can for sure now has an invocation spec and we put together this interactive observable document so you can explore it in more interactive way. It uses several tools like IPLD schemas to parse and validate schemas on the fly. It uses reference implementation to generate data sets from the code snippets. For example, here it showcases the tasks that this code snippet would generate. Uh, invocation that it would produce. And you can also go look at the whole car uh, that has a bunch of blocks in them, like the task we saw earlier, invocation that reference it, and authorization, and authorization itself. You can also go and modify the code, rerun it, and see how the data has changed. Uh, hopefully this is a more fun way to explore the specification than wall of text. I also hope you will join Web3 Storage and IPVM into implementing this specification. Awesome to see. I'm sure we're gonna hear a little bit more about the power of UCANs in our deep dive as well, um, but great to have good explorable specs. Um, a great, great example of using uh, observable for that as well. All right, um, NFT forever. Shrenuj, Scott, tell us more. Yes, hello, um, Scott here from uh, PhilDev. So today I'm gonna to, uh, talk to you guys quickly about uh, NFT forever, which is, uh, the goal is to preserve off-chain NFT data as a public good. And so we're combining a few new things uh, to, to give a new programmatic deal-making flow. So you're taking FEM, Filecoin, and Lotus, and what, what is the, the embryo of a FRC standard uh, to create a new programmatic flow. So you can see here, what we do is you make a deal proposal by calling a smart contract, you pay a little gas, Inside the smart contract, you have both the escrow, which is the file coin, and the data cap itself. That contract then acts as a client um, and emits an event for a deal proposal um, onto the blockchain that is picked up by a, a storage provider running Boost. They then grab the data out of the payload from the event, in this case, from nft.storage, which is a pre-aggregated car file of many NFTs. Uh, we'll do the sealing process, create a, a whole new deal, and then verify it back on chain through the smart contract, contract to say, yes, this is the, the SID that I want. Yes, this is the deal that I want. And then open it up to logic. So what we've done here is actually decoupled who's providing the data from who's providing the funding and the data cap, as well as who is going to be picking up and verifying the deal. So you start to see um, a more organic market, uh, marketplace uh, forming there. So we're producing a smart contract and we're going to have some storage providers on Pi Day to be accepting deals. I think we're getting up to at least, I think we're, I think we're targeting 70 deals a day um, for the first few weeks to kind of get it moving. Um, there were a lot of people behind this in uh, deal client contract. We had uh, multiple product managers across multiple groups um, and then big technical lifts from both uh, Lotus, Boost, um, and some folks like Micers as well. So that is coming. Everybody is heads down, which is why you had to suffer um, through me. Uh, and so that is going out next week. And let's give those guys uh, a good hand and, and watch it uh, accompanying the FEVM launch. Thanks. Super exciting. Showing the power of FEVM to take uh, all of these uh, kind of off-chain tools and bring them uh, use, utilizing this new automation framework. So hopefully uh, things get more verifiable, more automated, um, and just easier to run and maintain into the future as well um, with programmable storage. Pretty cool. Over to Jamie for the awesome countdown to FBM event from last week. Yes. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. I'm Jamie with the Outer Core events team here to tell you about um, our countdown to FBM event which took place last week on March 1st. It was the day before the East Denver conference portion started. Um, it was held in the same venue as the FEM Hacker Base. So it was hosted by the Falcon Foundation. So we flipped the venue over for the countdown to FEM event, which was a huge success. Um, lots of excitement surrounding the upcoming launch of FEM. It brought in 873 registrations and more than 300 in-person attendees including um, devs and investors in the audience. Uh, this event was streamed on ETH Global TV for virtual attendees and had over 50,000 live stream views, which is huge. It was actually um, the third largest audience from all events hosted on ETH Global TV. 
Um, there were lots of incredible presentations, panels, and more from 34 speakers, and there were 18 projects featured in the early FVM Builder Showcase. A couple of exciting things to highlight from Sarah and the FVM team, um, client contract deal making flow is live with a very big thanks to FVM, Lotus, and Boost and Dredge teams. And they did a demo of this at the event, and there's also going to be a recorded workshop shown on Scaling Ethereum Hackathon today at 12 PST on ETH Global TV. There's a couple of the record uh, links there with the recordings to the presentations from the event, the event photos, and a great sizzle reel there recapping everything, so be sure to check those out. Thanks to everyone who helped contribute to this being a huge success. Awesome. It was a fantastic event. If you weren't there, go watch the live stream from ETH Global because there's some good, good content. Um, and this was a component of our overall like Endres presence at ETH Denver, um, which happened last week in Denver, um, which was a super awesome gathering of um, tons of groups working across the Ethereum, uh, Filecoin, Layer 2, and, and many other related ecosystems. Um, we had a ton of different events that we um, helped host and or participated in. Um, there was a Launchpad and FVM Social, a Crypto Weekend Day, the Countdown to FVM event that Jamie just told us about. Um, there was some uh, awesome dinners organized by the TLDR team. Uh, and we also participated pretty heavily in the ETH Denver um, like uh, event itself. We had a booth there. We had some main stage talks. Um, we also helped judge the hackathon in, in many different areas um, and uh, saw a lot of amazing folks coming by, getting really excited about FBM and how they can make use of it, um, and, and also engaging super deeply with the kind of new breakthroughs that are coming, coming out of, of the PL network and, and our ecosystem these days. Um, and it was a great gathering point for many different builders um, from groups like you know, Huddle, Glyph, Impossible Cloud, um, and others who are all harnessing some of these new, new technology. Um, and so excited to collaborate with them as well. And now we have exactly 10 minutes to shoot over to our deep dive um, on Daghouse's W3F API client and protocols. Hey, I'm David, lead for Daghouse. We build Web3 storage and NFT storage, uh, which have grown a bunch in the last year. Alan, am I flipping to the next slide? Uh, because it is a reliable, performant, hosted IPFS solution that gets your data onto Filecoin. Uh, you can see total uploads have grown to 80% over the last year. Uh, but today's deep dive is about our next chapter as a team and a product. Next slide, please. Uh, to meet the needs of our users, we've had to utilize centralized input providers for performance, reliability, and scalability reasons. Uh, but the plan has always been to increasingly rely on decentralized Filecoin infra as it's become ready to reduce costs and take advantage of the global network of many independent nodes. Next slide. Uh, we had been planning to nucleate this year uh, with the immediate focus for us on adoption with users willing to pay a premium for our services. Uh, but given crypto winter, we've pivoted now to helping Endres enable the end-to-end -end Filecoin story from a user's perspective. Uh, this includes building protocols and libraries for developers to take advantage of Filecoin, regardless of whether or not they're a Web3 or NFT storage user, and dogfooding these protocols ourselves to progressively decentralize our own infrastructure as the Filecoin stack becomes increasingly mature. Next slide. Uh, so W3Up, we're excited to share details of our new upload protocol, W3Up, uh, in today's deep dive and uh, continuing throughout March. You might have heard a little bit about this in Lisbon last year, and it's come a long way since. W3Up is a storage protocol, API, and set of clients that allows users to verifiably upload data using their own identity. It's designed as a protocol to be used by any quote unquote storage service, not just Web3 and NFT storage, but anyone moving data around, especially across permission boundaries. Uh, we think it could be really useful for many Endres and PLN projects. W3Up offers a layer of abstraction for an actor to send data to another actor, only it does so in a self-sovereign and verifiable way, bringing IPFS and decentralized authorization protocols to the table. It fills a similar need, quote unquote, S3 compatibility compliance is trying to fill, only it's truly portable top to bottom. This also allows us to progressively decentralize our services as decentralized infra options become viable to fully rely on without requiring a big code migration from our users' perspectives. Uh, but it also does have a, a number of immediate benefits as well, uh, such as faster uploads. Next slide. And here's some of the libraries we've been working on uh, from the W3Up spec to the protocol and reference implementations uh, to the libraries built on top, like headless front end components and the CLI. Next slide. 
Um, and we're in beta, and users like OpenSea, Tableland, and Koi uh, have been trying it out and have had positive feedback about its interface and simplicity and how it just works. And then we have an RC coming out in a few weeks. Next slide. Um, and then in building W3Up, we've incorporated our team's learnings from running our hosted IPFS services at scale with competitive performance and reliability and talking to a bunch of users. Uh, these learnings are most obvious in two categories of lower level protocols. Uh, I know the word protocols is used generally pretty loosely, uh, but uh, we're heavily relying on um, what we call together the Deep Space Nine protocols, these lower level protocols. Uh, next slide. Um, and these two categories, uh, so first for da data verifiability, we obviously use IPFS, but more specifically, when we can, we send around sets of blocks in car files and verify those rather than transacting block by block. And this is even the case in user-facing situations like uploads and reads. And then for auth, we use UCAN. We use, we've worked with a bunch with Fission to design a protocol that services can practically use. Rockley shared this work in the UCAN invocation spotlight earlier. Um, and aside from user-owned identity and the benefits that come with that, you can also notably allows permissions to be trustlessly delegated from one party to another. Next slide. Uh, and then hopefully efficiency with verifiability sounds great to you. Uh, and taking a step back, we think there's a lot of uh, others in the PLN, um, a lot that others can utilize from W3UP and DS9, especially because they were built to be generic protocols. And our goal today is to get you excited enough in them to explore more. Um, and in terms of uh, folks to get you excited, no better person than Alan Shaw. So I'll hand uh, things off to him to talk more about the technical bits. Oh, no. OK, David, thank you. <laughs> I'm going to deep dive in five minutes. Uh, but this is going to be a little deep dive on uh, the new architecture we have for web free to storage and NFT to storage. And we call it W3Up. Uh, and, and here it is. So here is the big architecture diagram. But don't worry, we're going to build it really slowly uh, so it's easier to understand. So first of all, client side, server side, you get, you know, understand that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, we have uh, the client. Uh, and it could be like the CLI or the client libraries or a web app. Um, but it, what it does is it does some work locally. Uh, and that's on the left hand side there. Um, and what it does is it creates a car file um, of some DAG uh, of their upload uh, or the thing they want to upload. Um, and this is done in like a streaming manner. And this is interesting because like all of our DAG generation tooling uh, in JS so far has been focused on putting blocks in a block store. Um, so then we, we have to create the DAG in memory or on disk and into a, into a block store and then export it. And this is just like uh, slow and kind of memory intensive and disk or, or disk space in, intensive, depending on how you do it. And like in browsers, you only get a certain amount of memory to be able to do that sort of thing. You don't want to have another copy of it in memory. So we've had people complaining about that. So we built these tools to make it easier to just um, stream stuff um, up to our service. So uh, so that's kind of cool. Um, and so the other thing that the client does is it signs a UCAN um, with like details that are specific to their upload. Um, and it invokes this storage method, which is store slash add. Um, and it's either for their account or for someone else's account where they've been delegated access to put stuff in it. On, on behalf of them, which is amazing. Um, FYI, UCAN stands, if you didn't know, stands for User Controlled Authorization Network. Um, and so we've been collaborating with Fission on the spec. Um, and UCANs are essentially an extension to JWTs and they allow users to authorize what they do themselves. It's amazing. Um, so anyway, uh, once the UCAN is signed, um, it gets sent to our W3UP API, and we call this a UCAN invocation. Um, and the server validates the signatures and the delegation chain in the UCAN, um, and that ensures that the user has sufficient access to invoke the action, or what it's called in UCAN terms is capability. Um, and so in this case, the user is asking to add a car file to their storage space, um, and we, uh, we and uh, uh, and, and so what we do is we're, when we send um, car files, we actually address them by a CID. And that CID is a car CID. A car CID is just a special CID that is the hash of the entire car file. And that hash is baked into a signed URL that is sent back to the user. Um, and then that and that URL ensures that the data they upload um, must hash to the same value as the, as the car CID. So 
that's super cool. Um, and then the user takes that URL and uploads the data to that URL, um, the, the data being the car file. Um, and then the upload is complete. Um, so that's super rad. And the, the difference here from our old infra is aside from the UCANs, which is <laughs> like huge anyway, but uh, is, is that the car goes directly into a bucket. So there's no proxying for a worker. They don't send it to us. They send it directly to where it needs to be. Um, and that is effectively a speed increase and a cost reduction. And um, perhaps most importantly, the upload location doesn't necessarily have to be our, our service. It could go straight into Saturn or Filecoin, for example. Uh, so that's super cool. So then the, when the upload is in Elastic IBFS, uh, it's available for bit swap availability uh, for other people to bit swap as they do. Um, I've talked a bunch of times about how Elastic works, so I'm not going to re repeat it here. Um, I, did, I did a really good talk. I think I did a really good talk at IVFS camp uh, called Five Billion Blocks. Uh, if you're interested in uh, Elastic IVFS and how it works, then check out that. Um, so anyway, this upload process uh, is much faster and more reliable than it was previously uh, because the cars are generated in this streaming manner rather than all in memory. And also by storing it directly into the bucket, we are per upload request chunk size can be like four gig. It doesn't have to be like a hundred megabytes anymore. And then this is this is just makes stuff a lot, whole lot faster. So, uh, so super cool. And then you can see the difference in these benchmarks where uh, for W3 up, you can see like around 40% or faster upload speeds. Um, and then we can do some more up to to make this faster. Uh, the second upload is the same data. And the cool thing about W3UP is because we're using car CIDs and addressing things and using content addressing properly, um, you effectively get infinite compression. You don't have to upload the thing again. If someone else has uploaded that car file, you, the service just says you're done and you don't have to upload it. So it doesn't take any time to upload the thing. It's, it's zero. It's a 100% it's speed increase from... <laughs> uh, anyway, you, you get the idea. Okay, so anyway, back to the diagram. Sorry, moving on. I know we're short on time. Uh, ugh, the car is also sent to our Cloudflare hosted HTTP gateway. It's cached there for fast availability over HTTP. Our gateway is called W3 Link. You can access it at W3S.link. Uh, it's kind of similar to dweb.link. Um, and so the data gets copied there and it remains as a car at rest. It means that our gateway serves data, uh, serves IBFS content address data directly from car files, which is kind of cool. And in our gateway, we build some awesome indexes. We call one of them Dudeware. Uh, the other one is called SatNav. Uh, and uh, and that, that allows us to serve the IPFS content address data directly from those car files. Dudeware tells you which car files your DAG can be found in. It's a mapping from root CID of the DAG to one or more car CIDs. And then SatNav is a navigation within your car. Uh, SatNav index is a mapping from car CID to all the block offsets within the car file. So it's, it's actually a car v2 index if you know and care about that sort of thing. Uh, anyway, um, I digress a little bit. Uh, so if you want to know about, a bit more about gateways, then check out our gateway. It's called Freeway. Uh, it's very fast uh, and uh, good fun. Um, anyway, so pretty soon Spade will be uh, helping us put those car files in Filecoin uh, deals uh, with boost storage provi providers and renewing them as well. So that's going to that's gonna be awesome very, very soon. Um, and then throughout this whole process, our verifiable, uh, our verifiable UCAN log store um, uh, collects these uh, UCANs that we add, and that will uh, later provide us with verifiable transaction receipts. Um, and we can also track metrics through the data pipeline by um, looking at these uh, UCAN logs that we've got. Um, so you can also see the benefits of using UCANs uh, with a user-owned identity in the new architecture. There's verifiability at every step uh, in permissioned interactions uh, and user-owned portable identity. Uh, delegatable permissions allow more efficient data pipelines uh, from where the data is sitting. So for instance, like if you're a NFT minting tool, you can have your users upload directly to W3Up without needing to run a server to proxy the upload. And they don't even need to know that they're uploading to W3Up because they can just be delegated the permission to do it and then just send their data where it needs to be so they don't have to register with us or anything they just they can just be given access which is rad um cool i'm you probably really need really to skip this time. i'm gonna skip this bit um but the i'm gonna quickly just 
uh, talk about the, um, the problem that this is solving. And then if you want to look at the slides afterwards, they can. The biggest UX problem we have is how to make like public key cryptography tenable to a Web2 crowd. Um, the Web2 crowd are like, they're, they're used to centralized services and just let you log in with your email address. And so the problem is when you switch devices or lose a device or you drop your phone in the toilet, um, then how do, you, how do you gain access to your, your stuff if you lose your private key or don't have access to it from another device? Well, uh, we have a solution for that. And uh, that allows you to gain access to your stuff using just your email. And these are the slides that I'm just going to breathe past because I don't have enough time to present them, but you can go and look at them anyway. Blah, 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 blah. There we go. Cool. All right. So uh, wrapping up, hopefully. Up next for W3Up is that we've, we've built this UCAM based auth protocol so we can run W3Up on decentralized infra as well. DAG House will be doing, doing this um, a lot with our products, um, but based on your users' needs, you can use W3Up whenever you need to and get the UX benefits it provides. So, but um, some of the my favorite ideas that we're hopefully going to try and um, get get to doing is writing up those directly to Saturn L1s or Filecoin SPs um, and uh, UCAN validation and receipts and on the chain using the FVM uh, would be super rad. So I'm really excited for, for some of the stuff that is just literally opening up for us to take advantage of. Um, very cool. Uh, all right, that's about enough from me and David. I'm really sorry it's taken so long, but um, if you are interested in this, then please reach out. Um, you can check out our current beta. It's out at the moment. We're hoping for an RC later this month. Um, and yeah, oh, demos. We've got two demos, uh, demo sessions, a uh, big demo session for deeper dives. If you're interested in actual demo and usage and how, how things work um, on the March 24th, fourth on the 31st uh, and we'll record it and you can have it and um yeah uh thanks for here letting me squirt my voice at you for a while <laughs> super exciting and thanks to everyone who who stuck through to the end um and to all of our viewers um dive into some of these links because you cans are awesome i like to pitch them at every conference they are a super exciting new technology um, and enable us to do much more of the things that users expect in a Web3 native way. Um, so go and check out all of, all of this stuff more deeply um, and come to the IPFS thing if you want to talk about it more and see even more graphs and talk to the excited humans behind it in person. Um, so hopefully see you in Belgium in uh, about a month. So um, thank you everyone and have a wonderful rest of your day. Cheers, cheers. <laughs>